undo the battery or the back and roll the battery. Okay. Well, first a little background. Let's jump back to Reconstruction for a few minutes. Remember that during Reconstruction, Congress wanted to take control of reuniting the North and South into one nation. They wanted to take control of that process from the President because they wanted to make sure that the Civil War became the event that not only led to freedom for blacks, but full citizenship and the vote. And they wanted to ensure that Americans would treat these new citizens as equals. And so Congress rallied to pass an important piece of legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1875. In fact, this outlawed segregation. In 1875, we would not see any other piece of legislation or court ruling to support this law for nearly a hundred years. In fact, the Supreme Court declared this law unconstitutional. So Congress was considered radical at this time. The Republican Party was very much the party of civil rights in 1875. They were the party trying to get citizenship and the vote and equal protection and civil rights for African Americans. However, the rest of the country, particularly the President and the Supreme Court, did not agree. And so the Supreme Court declared this act unconstitutional. In fact, the ruling was Plessy v. Ferguson. And in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the Supreme Court declared that the 14th Amendment did not require integration. That separated facilities, separated communities by race could still be within the idea of equality before the law, as long as they were equal. And so the separate but equal precedent was established. Also throughout this time, most states passed laws called Jim Crow laws. And this is from an old song called Jump, Jim Crow, Jump. It's a silly song, but it, the connotation was that when the white man said jump, black man Jim Crow better jump. And that's where the term Jim Crow came from. And so Jim Crow implies a second-class citizenship status for African Americans. And so these laws were not just separating the races, but they mandated that black people better know their place, especially in the South. Now, history has shown that these facilities provided for black people be they water fountains or restaurants or cemeteries or hospitals or schools, were always inferior to that of whites. It's rare that you hear the word always, except if somebody likes to use it verbally. Always is a word that we try to avoid because it doesn't really mean something. It doesn't really mean much because it means it has to happen all the time. And it's rare that anything happens all the time, especially enough to use the word always. But it is in this case, is that what Brown v. Board was able to demonstrate is that separate equals second class citizenship. Is that these separated facilities were in violation of the 14th Amendment. So segregation continues into the 20th century, continues till today, though throughout parts of the 20th century by law, today sometimes by practice. But after the Civil War, many African Americans went north, both to escape racism, but also for job opportunities. Second World War sped up that migration uh, because of more job opportunities that the war provided. However, even in the north, Blacks tended to segregate by custom, and that was the expectation, in fact. 
And even in the North, there was racial tension, often over competition for jobs. Now, the Second World War created job opportunities for African Americans. Unemployment fell to its historic lowest point, around 1.3%. Because of the desperate need for fighting men, the effort to raise an army of 15 million, the armed forces ended discriminatory practices. Truman integrated the armed forces. FDR forbade discrimination in government jobs. By government jobs, I mean any war industry, any job in which he had power over, he required that discrimination would not be acceptable. Meanwhile, as returning black veterans came home to a country that continued to treat them as second-class citizens, This was unacceptable. Black Americans have now fought in integrated units alongside white Americans, fought and died, and risked all, and saved our country from the Nazis and the fascists and the Japanese. And they're just not going to accept being looked down upon. Nor should they have to. And so many of these become involved in the civil rights movement. At this time, the legal strategy of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was to focus on the glaring inequalities of segregated public education. It was believed this could be a place where inequality could be demonstrated unequivocally. And the legality of segregation could be challenged clearly. Because Plessy v. Ferguson mandated separate but equal. And as I said, history has shown that to be a falsehood. And so what Charles Hamilton Hughes believed would be inevitable, it was a matter of time, was that a clear demonstration of the inequality of segregated education was necessary to integrate American society, and that it started with the schools. And so he placed a team of law students under Thurgood Marshall. And they won 29 out of 32 cases argued before the Supreme Court. Imagine the persistence and determination of taking that many cases to the Supreme Court. These ladies and gentlemen were playing the long game, the patient perseverance of building a future that they might not even live to see. The Civil Rights Movement was about advancing equality even if it takes a lifetime. Now we all know the story of Brown v. Board, or at least you will in a few minutes. And this was considered Marshall's greatest victory. And I've got a clip highlighting some of the successes and achievements of this case in just a moment. Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka in 1954 the Supreme Court unanimously, that rarely happens, that all of the members of the Supreme Court agree. But remember, we are dealing with the Warren Court, Chief Justice Earl Warren and the more liberal Supreme Court at this time. So the Warren Court struck down school segregation. Mm -hmm. 
Now, within a year of Brown v. Board, over 500 school districts had begun to desegregate. So this demonstrates that some parts of the country were willing to accept this decision. Some parts of the country were willing to welcome others from other races and uh, ethnic groups and national origins into their schools. But not all. Some school districts, some state officials even, some governors, and of course many pro-white groups such as the Klan, actively resisted this movement towards integration. Again, the Supreme Court ruled in Brown Part 2 that desegregation must ensue with, quote, all deliberate speed. Yet, as you know, the Supreme Court has no power to enforce their rulings. It is up to the President of the United States to enforce the rulings laid down by the Supreme Court. Now, I'm sure you also remember that beginning with Truman, the Republican Party began to associate itself with these white supremacists resisting the civil rights movement. So if you wonder why you're seeing white supremacists becoming more visible in this campaign, it does date back to 1948. And it does continue. And the Republican Party has associated itself with these individuals from that time. And while Eisenhower liked to think of himself as socially liberal, he refused to enforce compliance with the Brown decision. Again, because his constituents. And this came to a crescendo at Little Rock, Arkansas. In 1948, Arkansas was in the process of integration until the governor of the state of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, ordered the State National Guard to stand in front of the doors of the university to turn away black students. And then a young girl, not much older than you guys, named Elizabeth Eckford, walked into the school anyway. Now the National Guard told her she could not attend that school. What's she going to do? Beat up the National Guard? She's a little girl, probably 18 years old. An angry crowd was amassed outside the school to help the National Guard prevent this young lady from entering. Can you imagine how much courage that must have taken? Finally, the president was forced to act. Because obviously, this young lady is intelligent. She's not shown up alone. I mean, she's got guts, but she's not stupid. She's invited the press. And they're filming this on live television of a black girl trying to enter a school legally and the governor of the state refused her entrance. And an angry mob has shown up to prevent her from entering. An angry mob resisting the law of the federal government. What do we call that, folks? I'm, I'm going to call it treason. Yeah. Let's call it that, an angry mob resisting the law of the federal government. So the president has to act. Because what happened when an angry mob refused to pay a tax in George Washington's presidency? He ate them. He rallied a militia and sent the militia. By the way, he led this militia. It's the only time I know that a president actually rode a horse leading an army to go put down a rebellion. 
And so George Washington put down this rebellion of the angry mob refusing to obey a federal law. I kind of wish old Eisenhower had ridden a horse with the 101st Airborne as they dropped in to uh, put down this rebellion. Because let's, let's not get things wrong. That's what it is, is an open rebellion. Of course, like Washington's story, once they saw a show of force, they backed down. And so when the paratroopers helped this young lady attend the University of Arkansas, the angry mob backed down. They were cowards deep down. Just like any other bully, when they're stood up to, they back down. She wasn't the only young lady. And I don't expect that the paratroopers escorted her to class every day. They just don't have the resources to do that. And she wasn't the only black American in the United States to attend school, obviously. And she wasn't certainly the only black American to attend school in places where they were unwelcome. That takes real guts. That's courage. Because you see, these African American students were constantly harassed by white students throughout the year. Yes, bully. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1975 gave the federal government to enforce um, integration. It also gave the federal government to the right to supervise uh, voting. So, Brown v. Board was the beginning of the process. The Supreme Court made this historic ruling. Of course, the practice of enforcing it is going to take some work. And the ruling only applied to public schools. Buses, hospitals, restaurants were still segregated. And this leads us to Rose Parks. In 1955, a young lady member of the NAACP, actually I don't know how young she was, but she was an officer of the NAACP, Rosa Parks, was arrested for not giving up her seat on the bus. The front of the bus was reserved for whites. The back of the bus reserved for blacks. She sat on the front of the bus. Now, passenger on the bus told her to get out of her seat and move to the back. She refused. Driver of the bus told her the same. She refused. Driver stopped the bus, called the police. The police came and escorted her off of the bus and she went to jail for a short time. And um, this was the beginning of a movement to boycott the buses, the Montgomery, the Montgomery, which is a town in Alabama, Improvement Association, was formed to organize a statewide bus boycott. And in charge of this boycott was a young Baptist pastor, only 26 years old at the time, named Martin Luther King Jr., led this movement. Now, meanwhile, Throughout the state of Alabama, but also throughout other segregated places where segregated buses were a problem, African Americans were filing lawsuits, would issue boycotts of buses in the areas where they were segregated. They would arrange carpools or even choose to walk. Whatever they had to do to avoid using segregated buses. And the idea was to put economic pressure on these bus companies to integrate. They were able to get support from the black community, but also many sympathetic whites um, followed the bus boycott as well. Now, public transit, especially in urban areas, is huge. Uh, if you live in a city, you can't really afford to own a car. There's nowhere to park. Where do you put said car? Not to mention the traffic, not to mention the expense of it. It's just not practical. If you live in a city, you use public transit. Unless you can afford a cab, which those things are ridiculously expensive, you use the bus. And so that meant that throughout many states, African Americans were choosing to not use the bus, which for many cuts them off from transportation. But some were so 
committed to this idea they would prefer to walk. Walk miles to get to work, to school, to whatever. But many were so passionate about this, they refused to ride on a bus that chose to treat them as second-class citizens. Until finally, in 1956, the Supreme Court outlawed segregation on buses around the land. But again, what you've seen so far is often a Supreme Court decision is the beginning of a process. Now, a little about Martin Luther King. Uh, he called his brand of nonviolent resistance soul force. Uh, he believed strongly in the power of civil disobedience and massive demonstrations. It had proved effective in India. In fact, that's how Gandhi was able to free India from British rule. Not through violence, but through peaceful, meaning civil, disobedience meaning find laws that are unjust and convince thousands of people to break those laws and fill the jails. And also massive demonstrations. Because only when the government and society sees that a massive number of people believe in this same idea will it be successful. Civil disobedience is rather difficult. It's based on Christian ideals of turning the other cheek. But it's also based on ideas of standing up for what is right and social justice. And he was often, and his followers were often, confronted violently by the police, by white supremacists, But they remained courageous in what has proved to be a long and arduous struggle. And Dr. King and others formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The purpose of this organization was to carry on nonviolent resistance to laws that they believed were unjust. But my, by 1960, Many still felt that progress was happening too slowly. That demanding respect from people who were filled with hate was never going to happen. And many believed that trying to reason with bigots was impossible. And so others formed and joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who were committed to more direct action. But the idea is that this is a grassroots campaign. This was, yes, televised and, yes, seen on the news, but it was formed, organized, and committed to by individuals. Now, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee also believed in nonviolence, but decided on a more confrontational strategy. Working with the Congress of Racial Equality, they decided to use sit-ins as a tactic to protest segregation. Like Rosa Parks, these groups would go to segregated restaurants and sit down to eat. The first of these sit-ins was in Greensboro, North Carolina at a Woolworths, which is an old department store. And black and white young people went to this department store and sat at a lunch counter inside the department store. An angry mob formed around the department store in Greensboro, North Carolina. But again, like Elizabeth Eckford, these people aren't stupid. They also invited the media to come. It's so a brave journalist came with their cameras and documented all of this. And it was shown nationwide on television. 
And because of these courageous individuals, the movement grew. In spite of abuse, in spite of the fact that these individuals were arrested and everyone around the country who was trying this was arrested and beaten up often, more people continued to do it. The movement spread to the north. In fact, by late 1960, lunch counters, meaning just restaurants around the country, were beginning to be desegregated. Now, in 1961, the Congress of Racial Equality tested the Supreme Court decision banning interstate bus segregation. Yet again, here's another case. The Supreme Court has made a ruling. It should have the power of law, but it requires the president to enforce it. Same with the Congress. And as we see with any unpopular law, People will choose to break it, hoping for government inaction, hoping for apathy. As we saw in the case of Prohibition, where widespread disobedience led to eventual repeal. But in this case, the disobedience was an injustice committed against minorities, and that was segregation. Now segregation has been outlawed thanks to Brown v. Board and thanks to cases outlawing segregation in buses throughout the United States. However, it took the courage of people willing to sit on the front of buses, black Americans willing to sit on white-only buses. Now they would often do this in states which were more tolerant, northern states. And then they would get bus tickets and they would ride down to southern states where this could cause problems. They called themselves the Freedom Riders. These young blacks and whites would sit on these buses and they would ride down to states like Alabama. In one case, one of these buses was actually set on fire by an angry mob that surrounded the bus on the streets of Alabama. Out of safety concerns, some bus companies said they would no longer carry these Freedom Riders. Out of fear. Because white terrorists were attacking these Freedom Riders in southern states. And it was working. So... The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the more extreme fringe of the civil rights movement, said they would continue to ride on these buses even if it got them killed. And in many cases, they were violently stopped. It did get them beaten. It did get them tortured. It did get them arrested. They would go into southern states where the states were refusing to obey the Supreme Court ruling and they would drag these people off the buses and beat them. But yet again, here we find a president unwilling to act and forced into action by courageous and determined people. Because yet again, as these people were being beaten, they were smart enough to invite the media and the media was filming this. And that's shameful. A peaceful country that has fought the Nazis is now attacking minorities simply because they're becoming too uppity by choosing to ride on a bus which was reserved for white passengers. How dare they, right? And it's embarrassing for a country which is supposed to be the leader of a free world and it's only providing freedom for a certain portion of its population. And so this action of being willing to get beaten for the sake of justice forced the president into action. In fact, President Kennedy ordered the Attorney General, his brother Robert Kennedy, to pressure the bus companies to continue transporting these riders. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Now, Robert Kennedy, Attorney General to the United States in the early 1960s, ordered that the bus companies continue to allow to carry these passengers because the Supreme Court has now ordered they have a right to be on the bus. Yet, the Alabama officials, which have no right legally to remove them from the bus, don't give them protection. So they say, okay, we have no right legally to remove you from the bus. Well, we're certainly not exactly going to be following your bus with the police cars. They don't give the protection <clears throat> that they were supposed to give. And so angry mobs surround the buses because the angry mobs know because I'm sure leaders of these mobs, the Klan, are closely affiliated with Alabama state officials, and they understand and know that the cops aren't going to be anywhere around this bus, and they can do whatever they want. And so that's how you wind up with situations where angry mobs surround buses and throw bombs into them. Because ordinarily, your average state patrol officer would come through, see this sort of thing, call in for support, and break up a riot, because that's part of their job. But it doesn't happen. So, again, these people aren't stupid. They have photographers with them. They have video cameras with them. And as you saw on the film, often the mobs would attack the journalists first. But, of course, newspapers began to denounce these beatings. Everyone on, uh, everyone watching television is seeing these things. And so Kennedy finally orders U.S. Marshals, one U.S. Marshal for every bus riding into the South. U.S. Marshals are some of the only officials authorized to carry weapons on buses or planes. And so they are sent to attack a federal marshal as a federal crime. And so they are sent into Alabama to protect these riders. And um, the Attorney General uh, uses the Interstate Commerce Commission Act to um, ban segregation in all interstate travel facilities. So the, the federal court ordered that um, buses be integrated. Alabama said they don't have to follow that within their own state law. So the Attorney General used the Interstate Commerce Act to say any vehicle transporting passengers between states falls under the protection of the federal government. Now the case of Ole Miss. In 1962, a federal court rules that James Meredith may enroll in the University of Mississippi because of Brown v. Board. Yet again, we find a situation where the governor of the state stood in front of the door of the University of Mississippi yet again with an angry mob and his National Guard to ban James Meredith from registering to enroll at the university. By the way, the, universe, uh, the state of Mississippi's flag still contains the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag was raised at Columbia, South Carolina in the 1960s, shortly after Brown v. Board in response to school integration. So though the Confederate flag may also be a symbol of the state of the battle flag of the Army of Virginia, it became a symbol of opposition to civil rights in the 1960s. And really it had all along been a symbol of that before. So, yet again, we have another governor standing in front of his school, refusing to let a black student in. And again, the black student who has invited the media is brave enough to refuse to obey the governor because he knows he has the federal government on his side that the Supreme Court has ruled that he has a right to enter this university. And that not even a state governor has the right to refuse his admittance. And so yet again, President forced into action. He ordered the federal marshals to escort this young man into the registrar so that he may enroll in the university. So Ross Barnett, governor of Mississippi, gets on the radio and tells the loyal, patriotic citizens of the state of Mississippi to rebel against 
the tyrannical federal government that has sought to assert its unlawful will upon the peaceful people of Mississippi. And they do. Thousands of people start breaking things, start burning things, start attacking African Americans in the state of Mississippi. As the federal marshals accompany this young man and have to provide federal police protection to a black man getting uppity enough to enroll in a university in the sacred state of Mississippi. Now, in April of 1963, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference formed a demonstration to desegregate the city of Birmingham, considered one of the most racist and bigoted places in the country. Dr. King gets arrested for trying to desegregate this capital of racism in the South, and he writes a letter from the Birmingham jail. And we'll look at the letter in just a moment. The TV shows the police attacking child marchers, using fire hoses on innocent people, using dogs to attack and clubs to beat. Yet these protests continue. They lead to an eventual economic boycott of all city businesses. And yet again, they invited the media. And eventually segregation came to an end in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, a bullet from the back of the bush took a man black. Now in June of 1963, just months before his assassination, John F. Kennedy sent troops to force the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, to desegregate the University of Alabama. <coughs> Meanwhile, an officer of the NAACP, Medgar Evers, was murdered by two members of the Ku Klux Klan. And they were let go. Scotch free in a hung jury. Hung jury means the jury could not decide on the guilt of these two men who murdered in cold blood someone who was seeking equality, who had harmed no one, and was murdered simply because these men felt he had become uppity. And again, the song that Bob Dylan wrote suggested that these men were but a pawn in the game of more powerful people. And the killers were set free. Now, the moment you've all heard of, in August of 1963, over a quarter of a million people converged on the Washington Mall, met and rallied and camped for several days around the Washington Monument. Speakers during this rally demanded immediate passage of a civil rights bill. Of course, the most famous of these speeches was Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech, which we'll listen to a quote from in a moment. And as we listen to it, I'll also pause and ask you, what would such a world look like where Dr. Dream's, Dr. King's hopes were fulfilled? What would such a place be like? And I also want you to think about Washington, D.C. Think about the place. Think about where all of this occurred. It was a big moment. And yes, it was a beautiful moment. But it's part of a long and ongoing process 
to get people to treat others as equal. And we're not there yet, ladies and gentlemen. We're not. Because people are still attempting to use us as tools. Now, September of the same year, four young girls were murdered in the fellowship hall of their church, which was below the sanctuary, as they were preparing a meal for dinner that night for their congregation. Members of the Ku Klux Klan threw a bomb into the church. Later claimed they did not intend to hurt the young girls. They did not know they were there, yet it happened nonetheless that these white terrorists threw a bomb into a church in Birmingham, Alabama. And of all the peaceful protests and movements, this tragic event made it clear the real intentions of the segregationist and polarized public opinion. And it is tragic that these young girls had to give their lives something they never thought they would have to do. Something they didn't want to do. They were just young girls. They just wanted to make a meal. But this polarized public sentiment in a way that perhaps it hadn't yet. Sometimes it takes a tragedy to make people realize what's actually going on. Think of the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory fire when 194 women perished pointlessly in a fire. And then finally the city started doing something about it, started requiring that factories obey the existing laws. And nobody, you know, people didn't want to think about racism and then four young girls died in a church. And then suddenly it becomes real for a lot of people that chose to ignore it. What is it going to take for us today to realize the effect of this hatred? Is it going to take innocent people getting killed before we realize what's going on? Sadly, it's probably going to take that. And it's probably going to come to that. I hope I'm wrong. But eventually, Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, ethnic origin, etc. The high point of the Civil Rights Act. Now, Dr. King's speech was part of the movement that became Freedom Summer. After the signing of the 64 Civil Rights Act into law, yes, a historic law, yes, an important one, yes, one of my favorites. But a law has to be enforced. And a law can require implementation, and an unpopular law is going to be resisted, bar none. And so Freedom Summer uh, became a goal to register blacks to vote even in states like Mississippi. And again, volunteers were beaten. Some killed. Businesses and homes and churches were set on fire, not only by the Klan, but by many others. People in the state of Mississippi formed their own political party. They called it the Freedom Democratic Party. And the voice of this party, Fannie Lou Hamer, gained national support. Now Johnson was afraid of losing the last bit of Southern white Democratic support. Many had already turned against the Democratic Party because of their association with the Civil Rights Movement. Johnson was afraid of, oh dear, states are going to start voting red. Gee, guess what happened? So he was afraid of that. He tried to pressure leaders of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to compromise. Oh, blacks actually voting and following the 15th Amendment is too much to ask. We're not ready for that yet as a nation. He was concerned about losing support in the South. 
This very same man that signed into law the 64 Civil Rights Act. So that was known as the Selma Campaign. In 1965, a voting rights demonstrator was murdered in this town for trying to register blacks to vote. As you heard, there was only roughly 2% of black Americans in the town of Selma of voting age that were registered to vote. So almost no blacks were voting in Selma, Alabama. Someone stood up and said, hey, we should get blacks registered to vote in Selma, Alabama, and they killed him. So Dr. King led about 600 protesters who were brave enough to cross into this town to try to register to vote, and you just saw for yourself what happened. The state of Alabama sent the police to beat and shoot tear gas and ride horses into these crowds. But yet again, the media was there documenting all of this. And guess what? A second march was held. And this time, 25,000 people showed up. And what are they going to do against 25,000 people? The point I'm trying to make is sometimes the government's not on our side. And sometimes it takes us getting involved and organizing to make a change. Now, that's the beauty of a democracy. You know, our founding fathers realized that sometimes our government would get corrupt, that our government wouldn't always be on our side. And so embedded within the Constitution is the idea that the people hold the ultimate powers of society. And it took brave people standing up, yes, to our government, to force our government to act, and finally Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This outlawed literacy tests. It allowed not state officials, but federal officials to enroll voters who answered to the President of the United States. And the end result of this was a great increase in black enrollment. It's amazing stuff, folks. And what I hope you realize is it's not just something that happened in the 1960s, it's something that's happening today. The need for concerned, compassionate, and active citizens is more pressing than ever. You know, this is not just history class. This is me trying to get you to wake up and realize what the heck is going on today. And to understand that unless we do something, our government will continue to turn a blind eye to injustice. That it often takes we the people to unite and seek change. We cannot rely on others. So first off, we've been talking about the fight to end segregation. And as we've talked about, the 1960s were a great period of progress and victory in regards to de jure segregation, meaning segregation by law. Unfortunately, however, de facto segregation, or segregation by custom or practice, was still very prevalent. Despite Brown v. Board, despite the Civil Rights Act 1968, despite voting rights and the 1964 Civil Rights Act and all of these amazing laws and court cases, there still remains much work to be done, even today. Now, after the Second World War, as, as blacks were migrating to northern cities um, and whites were migrating out of northern cities, um, this led to a situation throughout many cities in America where uh, the inner cities uh, were dominated by African Americans. And those properties in which many African Americans were residing were owned by landlords, often white Americans living outside of the cities. 
And um, because of such a low tax base in these cities, and because of the crumbling infrastructure and the poorly funded social services, um, many of these slums, as they were called, were dilapidated, uh, meaning substandard living conditions. Unemployment among the black community as of the end of the 1960s was twice as high as that of white Americans. And so many black Americans became angry, not just became, but the anger festered and has festered throughout uh, because of what many have perceived as unfair treatment by white authority figures, including police officers. And so throughout the mid-1960s, uh, we see numerous clashes between white authority figures and black civilians. Sadly, race riots were often the norm and not the exception. That's what makes Martin Luther King and his movement so incredible, is that he chose to remain nonviolent, even though many became impatient with that strategy. And that's who we'll be talking about today, those who became impatient with the idea of nonviolence. Many whites were unable to understand why it is that African Americans were so angry. Many white Americans today misunderstand the Black Lives Matter movement and why African Americans could be so angry. Now, many blacks today and in the 1960s feel that equal opportunity in jobs may be legal by law, but is not happening in practice. Not if minority groups are experiencing this level of unemployment as opposed to white Americans. And also, sadly, the high ideals that we discussed in the war on poverty are being diverted to make funding room for the Vietnam War. It's just a fact throughout American history uh, that wars have diverted a country's attention from domestic policies to foreign aggressors. And so brilliant, ambitious, hopeful domestic programs like the War on Poverty are sometimes not feasible during a war. What we're looking at here is an aerial photograph of Detroit during one of the worst race riots in American history. What we're looking at here are National Guardsmen being called into the city of LA in response to race riots following the death of Martin Luther King. There were riots in over a hundred cities across the nation when Dr. King was assassinated. Not all blacks felt that Dr. King's dream would be possible. And so some, including members of the Nation of Islam, and that is a black nationalist movement, advocated a separation from white Americans, that whites and blacks should not mingle. The Nation of Islam preached that white Americans were the source of many of black people's problems historically, and that members of the Nation of Islam should seek separation and want nothing to do with white Americans. Perhaps their most vocal and confrontational leader is Malcolm X. Denzel Washington recently played Malcolm X, did an excellent job, I highly recommend it. He was a very controversial leader even among his followers. He received a great deal of publicity for his inflammatory statements, for his arousal of anger among his followers. And he did manage to frighten people because, like John Brown, he was pointing out that peace was not possible and that violence perhaps was inevitable. Now some resented this figure and he did become divisive within his own community. Though later in Malcolm X's life he traveled to Mecca 
capital of the Muslim faith, their second holiest city, excuse me, actually their most holy city, and it is required of all Muslims at some point in their life to make a great hajj or pilgrimage. It is one of their five pillars of faith. All Muslims must, if able, make a journey to the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And while there, they all wear white. They all circle the dome of the rock several times throughout the day. Hundreds of thousands of them gathered in the same place. They all pray peacefully. They all treat each other equally. They all wear the same simple clothing. And they all address each other as brother and sister while on this pilgrimage. And most Muslims point to this journey as one of the most important journeys in their life. And for Malcolm X, it certainly was the case. In fact, he had a pretty powerful experience while in Mecca. Because though he was filled with this anger towards white people because of their historic mistreatment of African Americans, while in Mecca, Everyone treated each other equally. Everyone referred to each other as brother and sister. He walked and prayed with people of blonde hair, blue-eyed, pale skin, and then walked alongside other black Muslims and walked alongside people from all walks of life, from all over the world. And he came back with a completely different message, that perhaps whites and blacks could get along in the final analysis, and that instead of bullets, Blacks should begin to reach for the ballot, pursuing the cause of voting to gain greater representation in our democracy. And he came back with an entirely different message. Well, Malcolm X's brand of anger and hatred that he had stirred up was not that easily settled. And eventually he was murdered by a member of his own group while giving a speech in 1965. The Nation of Islam was not the only group that disassociated itself with Dr. King's movement. Over time, the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee became more and more militant. While Dr. King's group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, continued to practice nonviolence. The head of the SNCC was a man named Stokely Carmichael. He began to urge his followers to use the phrase black power and whose symbol was a raised fist. And you can find photographs from the time, even recent photographs where you'll find African Americans using the raised fist as a symbol. The idea of the black power movement was that blacks could control their own lives and communities and did not need the white man and did not want the white man in their lives. And one of the militant wings of the black power movement was a party known as the Black Panthers. The black Panthers were formed as a protective wing for the black community. It was their belief that the police discriminated, abused, and mishandled their powers, especially towards minorities. And so the Black Panthers did not want the police in their communities, did not trust the police. They believed they could protect and serve their own community. They also preached the ideas of Mao Zedong, ideas of communist collectivism, that the African Americans could take care of themselves by distributing resources and ensuring survival collectively. And often the Black Panthers did have violent confrontations with the police. They remained popular among the black community, 
but have to this day endured as controversial figures in the history of civil rights. In fact, another lesser known figure that is not in your book, Charles Manson, when he began his string of murders, he always pinned the murders of white women on the Black Panthers. And then often he liked to murder police officers. And he would pin them on the Black Panthers. And then sometimes he would murder white women. But I already said that. <laughs> sometimes he would murder black women as well. And he would frame the police. His idea was to stir up what he called helter-skelter. What he believed to be an inevitable clash between the races. And so his killings were to provoke this violence. So now we have to talk about a great tragedy. One of um, the most heroic figures in the civil rights movement who always objected to the black power movement and its preaching of violence, who always taught compassion and equality and community, gave one last speech on April 3rd of 1968. And in this speech, he seemed to predict his own death, and he quoted the book of Exodus, and he said, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I have been shown the promised land, but I will not go with you. And on the very next morning in Memphis, Tennessee, James Earl Ray shot and killed Martin Luther King Jr. Now, meanwhile, Robert Kennedy was campaigning for president. The Democratic primaries were ongoing at that time. Robert Kennedy proved to be the strongest front runner at that time. And he was going to give a speech at a rally, and then Dr. King was killed. He was encouraged by his constituents to cancel the rally, though he persisted. In fact, he went on to speak at Martin Luther King's funeral. And I'll play the speech for you at the end of the lesson. But let me paraphrase. Robert Kennedy said, when you teach a man to hate, when you teach a man that he is less or more than his brothers because of the color of his skin. You do not bring about unity. You teach only violence. And the mindless menace of violence in America today is a great tragedy. Robert Kennedy also went on to implore people to not react violently to this peaceful man's death. But in fact, his death led to the worst urban rioting in American history. Over 100 cities engulfed in flames in the days following his death. In fact, Robert Kennedy himself, who's another great hero of mine, was assassinated just two months later, right after speaking of the need of peace and brotherhood and the carrying on of Martin Luther King's legacy. And while accepting the Democratic nomination for the candidate for President of the United States in 1968, he was shot and killed by a Jordanian immigrant because of the U.S.'s support of Israel. <clears throat> These are violent times, ladies and gentlemen. Why all of this violence? Why all of this hatred? Well, Lyndon Johnson had the same question. In fact, he appointed a presidential commission to study the causes of urban violence. And in their 200,000 page deposition, of which I'll summarize, 200,000 page deposition, 
and it was called the Kerner Commission Reports. They named racism as the main cause of the tensions and violence of the 1960s. Now, I'm grossly oversimplifying here. <laughs> they gave much more detail. There were some gains, many gains in the civil rights movement, even gains in the later part of the 1960s when things seemed dark. For example, the Civil Rights Act of 1968 prohibited discrimination in housing. As a result of the civil rights movement and equality and integration, more black students have been able to finish high school and go on to college and even get better jobs. Real progress has been made. African Americans have, um, through this experience, gained a greater pride in their racial identity uh, and have demanded among many universities black studies programs. And so at many colleges you can take classes on African American history, black studies. Uh, we even have a Black History Month now. African Americans are more visible in pop culture. We see more blacks in movies and on television. We also see more blacks voting. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 led to an increase in voter registration. And this resulted in more black elected officials and politicians having to consider the black vote common topic of discussion in our ongoing presidential campaign, who are black Americans voting for, because now they are able to vote. And the legal barriers preventing southern blacks from voting have been removed by law, and now federal officials register voters, not state officials. Yet there is much work to be done. Civil rights movement is not a thing of the 1960s. It's part of our lives today. In fact, perhaps because of the Vietnam War, perhaps because of the violence, and in many cases the forced busing of African Americans to facilitate integration as a result of Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, versus the United States. Yes, did you know that in Charlotte Mecklenburg a case was taken to the Supreme Court because Charlotte Mecklenburg schools did not want to have to go pick up black students and take them to white schools and the US Supreme Court ruled that oh yes you're going to go pick up black students and take them to white schools. Whites propagandized that idea and called it forced busing. But the continued discrimination again has been by custom, if not by law. White flight has reversed much of the progress towards school integration because communities tend to remain segregated even to this day. Unemployment and poverty among the black community remain significantly higher than that of white Americans. One effort to overcome this has been affirmative action, and that is that companies, especially those who deal with the federal government, have been expected to hire a certain amount of minorities and women in job positions as a result in a hope to overcome years of discrimination. Some have criticized this policy as reverse discrimination, such as the Supreme Court of back versus the University of Regents in California. Um, this young man was attending a medical school or he had applied for, and he had been denied entrance to the upper level of his medical school. He was a white American, white male, and he was able to demonstrate in the US Supreme Court that they had chosen a black person who was less qualified than him to fulfill the requirements of affirmative action. He gained admittance to the school and it set the precedent of the eventual reversal of affirmative action. 
I don't know if you noticed, but the nationality of the soldiers who died were French. They were speaking French. And um, in the late 1800s, until the Second World War, Indochina was ruled by the French. It was a colony of theirs. French farming plantations employed North and South, Vietnamese, Laos, and Cambodians. Indochina was a united French colony. And during the Second World War, this all changed. The Japanese conquered Indochina along with most of Southeast Asia. And during the Second World War, Ho Chi Minh, leader of the Vietnamese independence movement, helped to create the Indochinese Communist Party, whose goal it was to rid Vietnam, Vietnam of Japanese influence, to liberate their country from the Japanese. They called themselves the Viet Minh. And in September of 1945, after the Second World War was over, after the dropping of the atomic bomb, Vietnam was no longer under Japanese control, and Ho Chi Minh declared Vietnam an independent nation. After the Second World War, the French decided they wanted to retake and reclaim their former colony. Ho Chi Minh vowed to fight against the French from North Vietnam. As the French troops moved in, they fought and were able to regain cities throughout South Vietnam. And from this time until 1975, the United States became involved in the conflict in Vietnam. Now, in the time of 1950, we were only involved from an economic standpoint. The Truman Doctrine mandated that we support the resistance of communist movements anywhere in the world. And since the French were fighting against the North Vietnamese, led by the Ho Chi Minh and his Communist Party, we started sending military and economic support to the French. This was based on the domino theory. And that is that countries can fall to communism like a row of dominoes. That if Vietnam falls to communism, Laos and Cambodia will also fall to communism. That if the French are overrun, South Vietnam will fall. And short of sending U.S. troops, the Eisenhower administration believed that we should provide all aid. Now the French were overrun. At the final battle at Dien Bien Phu, the French surrendered and it was agreed that Vietnam would remain a divided country along the 17th parallel. An election was called to unify the country in 1956, yet it would remain divided until 1975, and this would begin the Vietnamese Civil War, which would last for 19 years during which time the United States became increasingly involved. And I'll spoil the ending for you. At the end of this war, Vietnam did become a single country under Ho Chi Minh's communist dictatorship. Yet not before 58,000 Americans lost their lives on this distant part of our planet. So when the French surrendered at the Geneva Accords, it was agreed that Vietnam would be divided into two parts, North and South Vietnam. North Vietnam would be a communist nation led by Ho Chi Minh and the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. South Vietnam remained under the control 
of a brutal and repressive regime itself. This was led by a man named Ngo Diem. So while Ho Chi Minh was a dictator, and while his regime was intolerant of opposition, he was very popular with the people for his land redistribution program. Though freedom of speech was not tolerated and dissent was quelled often violently, the people loved Ho Chi Minh simply because they were guaranteed a piece of land that was their own. Meanwhile, in South Vietnam, Ngo Diem refused elections, refused to allow the democratic process to choose whether he stayed or was replaced. Yet Diem's regime had the backing of the U.S. military. The agreement was we would provide military support in exchange for the transition to a reform democratic government in South Vietnam. Diem did not keep his part of the bargain. He was extremely corrupt. Like Ho Chi Minh, he stifled those who opposed him. And he even went so far as to restrict Buddhism in South Vietnam. This was a wildly unpopular policy. Diem was a Catholic. Diem wanted to encourage the practice of Catholicism in South Vietnam, and he went so far as to restrict the most popular religion in South Vietnam, that of Buddhism. Now, meanwhile, an insurgency formed in opposition to Diem's regime. They called themselves the Viet Cong, and that was the communist opposition group fighting from South Vietnam. They began to kill public officials serving under Diem's regime, committing acts of terrorism, and committed themselves to guerrilla warfare against the established government. And Ho Chi Minh was sending them resources along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail ran through Laos and Cambodia. It was extremely effective because the United States could not break the supply line without an act of war against Laos or Cambodia, two countries we were not involved with politically at this time. Now, like Dwight D. Eisenhower, Kennedy also continued to back Diem's regime, first financially, second by sending military advisors. So Kennedy actually took it a step further by sending the Green Berets to train Diem's forces to become sustainable. Meanwhile, to quell this insurrection, Diem used a common tactic. He called it the Strategic Hamlet Program. We've seen this before. The Butcher Weiler in Cuba placed insurgent civilians into concentration camps, hundreds of thousands of them, to root out suspected insurgents. We did this in the Philippines. Other countries have done this throughout history as a means of quelling rebellions by rounding up everyone and keeping them under supervision. It's an effective tactic to stop an insurrection, but it also makes a leader very unpopular when he begins to do this to his own people. Not to mention, he continued to press his attacks on Buddhism. And you have to see this for yourself. In protest of Diem's brutal repression of the Buddhist faith, several monks invited the media to witness their self-immolation as they burned themselves in protest. This brought international attention to Diem's repression of free expression. In fact, in response to the international outcry for Diem's removal, the United States supported an assassination 
of Diem, and he was killed. Ironically, Kennedy died within a few weeks of Diem's assassination. I'm not suggesting the two are connected, I just think it's funny how close the two came within each other. So, following Diem's assassination, South Vietnam became increasingly unstable. The person who replaced Diem proved to be ineffective. He was replaced, and so on and so on and so on. And so a series of revolutions was tearing the country apart. Johnson realized that without U.S. military intervention, South Vietnam would fall to the communist, and he believed this would result in a U.S. a loss of American prestige. And then an alleged attack occurred in the Gulf of Tonkin where allegedly two North Vietnamese patrol boats attacked the USS Maddox off the coast of the Gulf of Tonkin, which is in North Vietnamese waters. This led the president to announce the need to put troops on the ground in South Vietnam to prevent the fall of South Vietnam to the communists. By the next year, eight Americans had been killed, and Johnson ordered sustained bombing of the North and full U.S. involvement. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution gave him this broad executive power to do so, and it was found out later, not until 1975, that Johnson had plans to do this all along, and that the Gulf of Tonkin was merely a ruse to allow the president to send troops to Vietnam. That realization was published in the Pentagon Papers. In fact, that resulted in a Supreme Court case. The United States tried to sue the New York Times for publishing that information. They persisted and they won the right to publish this incriminating evidence against Johnson's administration for starting the Vietnam War. Yet the war has begun. So what you just saw was an excellent review of the war. And you saw that this is a war that the United States lost though we inflicted ten times as many casualties as our own. But this was also the first televised war. Now in the beginning, Johnson was conflicted. He had won the presidency partly on his promise to keep troops out of Vietnam. However, even while he was running, his advisors were pressuring him to get involved in this conflict. His Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, had advised the President on escalation, as well as his Secretary of State, Dean Rusk. So essentially, the Jobs Administration was pressuring the President to approve boots on the ground. And I want you to understand that in 1964, when the Tonkin Gulf Resolution was announced, the public was in favor of this conflict. And yet, by the summer of 1969, we'll be hosting Woodstock and peace protest and Nonviolent resistance to the war and the burning of draft cards will become the norm and not the exception. Yet in the beginning, the public supported this war. And yet we've seen this in every American conflict throughout our country's history. That in the beginning, the public supports a war. That in theory, we love a good fight. But in reality, there's a stark contrast. As the troop buildup escalated, 
Commander of Armed Forces in Vietnam, William Westmoreland. General Westmoreland felt that the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, called the ARVN for short, was ineffective at stopping the North Vietnamese invasion of South Vietnam. He requested increasing numbers of troops to bolster the South Vietnamese army. And Johnson finally made the decision to escalate the war and by 1967 there were half a million U.S. soldiers in South Vietnam. Now the Viet Cong, that is the South Vietnamese insurgency, was now facing the most ingeniously mechanical nation on earth, according to General Sherman from the Civil War. The most powerful military on the planet was landing on the other side of the world to quell a local insurgency in the name of stopping communism. And so the Viet Cong resorted to guerrilla tactics. Hit and run, ambush, disguises, moving among civilians. The Viet Cong were fighting in their home country. And so they had the defensive advantage. Because the United States now had to serve the role of a foreign aggressor. One of the most difficult military strategies in warfare. The Viet Cong were able to dig in uh, using tunnel systems. And so they could withstand airstrikes. They could launch attacks from within South Vietnam because they had the support of the people generally. And on Viet Cong territory, they would use booby traps, IEDs, improvised explosive devices. And the United States had to find these insurgency bases. I and mean, this became a very difficult task. However, we had the tactical advantage. We had superior weaponry. The Viet Cong were being supplied by the Chinese and Soviets, and so they did have modern weaponry. And these supplies were being funneled through North Vietnam along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yet while they were being supplied indirectly by third parties, we had the most resources. We had control of the skies. Our F-14 fighters were indomitable. Now later in the war, Soviet MiGs were engaged in dogfights with our American fighter pilots. We had more resources than the enemy. We are the wealthiest nation on earth at this time going up against a third world country. So Vietnam became a war of attrition. Attrition means destroying the enemy by demoralizing them. And the tactic that Westmoreland decided to implement was known as the body count. By keeping up with enemy kills, comparing them to friendly losses, we would demonstrate our superiority on the battleground. It was believed that we could crush the insurgency through superior force. Yet, the Viet Cong remained defiant. They were also being supplied by the Soviet Union as well as China. Also, in regards to morale, the United States saw this as a military struggle 
The Viet Cong saw this as a battle for their very survival. Because we had to be the foreign aggressor, it was a difficult task to win hearts and minds. The United States wanted to stop the Viet Cong from winning the support of the rural population. However, the longer we were in country, the more unpopular we became and the more popular the Viet Cong became. The weapons we had to use in this conflict weren't helping us win any popularity contest. For example, dropping bombs on the enemy also wound and kill civilians. Search and destroy missions led to the destruction of many villages. For example, Napalm. Napalm is a gasoline-based bomb that, when dropped, sets fire to everything it touches. When the bomb burst, everything that the napalm touches catches fire. In fact, it's a sticky substance that would stick to the skin. You're going to see some terrible examples of that in just a moment. We were fighting in dense foliage, tropical conditions. As you saw in the clip, it makes it difficult to fight in those conditions, allowing the enemy the advantage of cover. We began to use a herbicide known as Agent Orange. It was very effective at destroying the foliage and removing the cover from the enemy. We could drop this over a jungle, wait a few days, and the jungle would be dropped, exposing the enemy hideouts. Well, that toxic chemical is um, hazardous. My dad's best friend died from Agent Orange exposure. I'm sure you've known people to have died from this as well. Also, these search and destroy missions search and destroy missions, like what you've seen in some of these clips, were the preferred tactic of the U.S. military. Since we were fighting an insurgency and there was no ethnic difference between the enemy and civilians, we had to go on patrols. Essentially, we had to serve a police function, investigating every single village and looking for the enemy. Um, this means we had to suspect anyone and everyone, and it often led to the destruction of property, it often led to false arrests, and it often caused refugee crises. When there is a war in your home country, you will probably try to flee for safety. You know, perhaps some of your family will join the military in fighting in defense of this country, but you will seek safety for your family. That's called a refugee crisis. That's what's going on in Syria. That's what's going on in other parts of the world. That's what happened in Western Europe when the Nazis took over. And that's what happens in any country where there is a war on their own soil. And so the refugee crisis caused over 3 million people to flee their homes in South Vietnam. And often they were relocated to refugee camps set up by the U.S. military. So ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you any more about warfare than what that man just said. It's one thing to see it in the movies, it's another to have to live through that. If you've ever seen anyone seriously injured or killed, then you know what I'm talking about. Now, the type of warfare that we were engaged in, um, the types of conditions that our troops were forced to fight in, and the lack of progress as the war went on had a significant effect on the morale of our soldiers.
Many soldiers turn to alcoholism or drug use. There were even cases of fraggings where soldiers would kill their superior officers or refuse to go into combat or refuse to follow orders. The South Vietnamese government was seen as very corrupt and unstable. In fact, um, the unpopularity of the South Vietnamese government was causing massive demonstrations among the South Vietnamese. Generally, most soldiers believed in the justice of halting the spread of communism. And for every story of dishonorable conduct, there are countless stories of courage. And for every story of disloyalty, there are numerous stories of bravery and um, self-sacrifice. Most soldiers generally felt they were doing their duty. However, this sense of duty had to be coupled with an understanding of realism and what was going on in the country. That our soldiers were fighting to preserve a government that did not seem democratic in the least and was largely unpopular and disliked by its own people. And this war that we had been fighting was showing no clear results and so many soldiers turned to humor to try to rationalize this insanity. It's also unfortunate that any conflict in which we engage is going to halt domestic spending programs. The war grew more costly as more soldiers landed in country. This contributed to a rise in the inflation rate, an increased level of taxes, and a reduction in domestic spending programs. Essentially, the war on poverty was put on hold for the Vietnam War. But I cannot emphasize the power of seeing these things for yourself. It's one for, thing for me to tell you about war and how awful it is. It's another to experience death. Seeing it on television now is perhaps not as powerful, but it's still more personal than reading about it in a newspaper or hearing about death on a radio report. Every night, Americans tuned in and watched the nightly news. That's how people stayed up to date. And every night, Americans tuned in and saw soldiers returned in coffins. And this shows a stark picture of the war. While Johnson's administration was reporting victory, 10 to 1 casualty rates. Critics began to describe a credibility gap between what the administration was reporting and what they were seeing on the television. Again, this is the very first war that was televised, that people could see, that journalists and correspondents were traveling with U.S. patrols and filming these actions and they were showing up every day. People began to doubt the possibility of success, began to doubt the chief objectives in this war even. Now, one of the most divisive factors in this war is that it utilized the draft system. Also known as the selective service system or the draft, called men from age 18 to 26 into compulsory military service. That means that if you were selected for the draft, 
it would be a federal crime punishable by prison if you did not report for duty. Not everyone wanted to go to war. And so thousands began to look for ways to avoid the draft. Many sought medical deferment by um, being deemed unfit for war. For example, when my grandfather reported for the draft in the Second World War, it was discovered he had ulcers. He had not caused himself to have ulcers. It was a lifetime condition. Uh, but he was deemed unfit for combat duty. And so he spent the war as an, a military police officer in New York City. Um, that was called medical deferment, meaning that the doctors felt that his condition would affect his ability to serve in combat, and so he was given a non-combat role through the war. Some people in Vietnam were seeking medical deferment by uh, creating fake medical conditions. People would swallow cotton balls, and so the x-rays would show a mass inside their stomach. People would um, contract certain diseases on purpose to attempt to avoid medical deferment. Um, another controversial factor in this war is that if you were in college, you didn't have to submit to the draft. So as college students, you would be exempt from the draft in the Vietnam War. That's great, right? But that seems a little unfair. And to many Americans, that seemed very unfair. Uh, because while you guys are recipients of a really neat scholarship that has allowed you to go to college for free, at this time, those who were going to college were mostly those who could afford it and of those were mostly affluent white Americans. In fact, 80% of combat soldiers in the Vietnam War were coming from um, lower economic levels. Like my uncle, my dad's family, they didn't have very much money. Uh, my dad was the only one that was able to go to college. The others were subject to the draft in Vietnam. Here's a great example of an anti-war poster. Um, the artist has used the image of Uncle Sam, a uh, bit of satire, because normally the images of Uncle Sam uh, have him pointing, saying, I want you to serve in the Army. And so this one is a play on that, saying, I want out. Um, if you look closely, it also appears he's wounded, uh, still holding his um, symbol of America still wearing his kind of patriotic revolutionary uniform, so still um, the idea that this artist considers himself an American, but not a supporter of this war. So the next section is titled The Working Class Goes to War because so many of the soldiers in combat were from uh, levels of poverty, and since minorities experienced higher levels of poverty than that of white Americans, African Americans served in a disproportionate numbers, uh, meaning that per capita there were far more blacks than there were whites in this war. Uh, the Defense Department attempted to correct the problem by instituting a draft lottery in 1969. These events were televised, and literally if your name was drawn out of a hat, you went to war. Um, racial tensions were also evident in the military. Units were integrated by executive order. And the 1960s were a turbulent time in regards to race relations, and that was also true um, at the front. In this war, also women served. 10,000 women served. Uh, as members of the Women Auxiliary Corps. Though not allowed to serve in combat roles, these women served as nurses, as uh, drivers, as um, uh, any non-combat auxiliary role. Typists, um, errand runners, uh, cooks, auxiliaries. Uh, thousands volunteered in the American Red Cross or the United Services Organization as well. So here we see an integrated unit. 
in the Vietnam War. You've got African Americans alongside white American soldiers. And here we see women serving um, in non-combat roles, but these women could have served as drivers, uh, cooks, um, non-coms, etc. So the roots of opposition in the Vietnam War um, emerged from many young students. In fact, the New Left uh, was an organization of youth in the 1960s that demanded sweeping changes along with the students for a democratic society and the free speech movement. These groups criticized big business, criticized the government, seeking greater individual freedom. Many of these ideas spread among college campuses. Students organized to protest various issues related to free speech in the war, individual freedom, the corrupt control of big business, as well as the Vietnam War. And so in this next section, we'll be listening to a collection of protest songs. You gotta start with the Beatles. <laughs> so, the protest movement continued to grow as the war continued to go on. Uh, as early as 1965, there were protest marches and rallies that were drawing tens of thousands of young people. By the next year, students were required to have good academic standing. So the blanket deferment for college students was amended to mean that you had to be passing your classes. So can you imagine that type of conversation with Miss Hill saying, you're not passing your classes, you're gonna go to the Vietnam War, unless you get your act together and start doing your homework. <laughs> it sounds silly, but I had a professor who was a professor during the Vietnam War, he had a student who was failing his class. A student came to his office one day and said, I really need help to pass your class. The professor said, this is college, that's not how that works. Take it again in the fall. The student said, Dr. Gunner, you don't understand. Um, I'll lose my good academic standing if I fail your class. I'm going to be drafted to the Vietnam War. The professor was um, not a fan of the war himself. And so he always used that as a story to say this was the one time I made an exception to allow a student to make up work beyond the deadline because he was going to be drafted and killed and I didn't want that on my conscience. So he tried to use that as an illustration of how hardcore he was, but also he was teaching us about this um, draft during the Vietnam War, which thankfully was the last time the draft has been used. So as a result of the uh, amendment to student deferment, the Students for a Democratic Society began to call for civil disobedience, uh, meaning that many began to burn their draft cards publicly. In fact, there's a cover photo on Time Magazine of all the editors burning their draft cards for the cover photo, which by the way is a federal crime. Now, um, the SDS began to counsel many students to leave the country, and many did, going to Canada. Small number of returning veterans became involved in the protest movement and protest songs as the next one became very popular. So as these anti-war demonstrations and protests increased, some did become violent. You know, civil disobedience means the mass breaking of laws that are considered unjust. That does mean confrontations with the police. As I said, some men chose to burn their draft cards, which is a federal crime. Some simply refused to serve, which is mandatory imprisonment. And some did flee to Canada. So as the war continued, it became increasingly unpopular. Different administrations tried to handle this dissent in different ways. Historically, there is nothing more corrosive to the morale of a society than a nation that is divided 
In fact, to quote Nixon, he said, uh, the single greatest threat to our country is the opposition to the war in Vietnam. I'm not saying I agree with that statement, but that's how he felt. And so the government's going to take measures to quell this dissent. Uh, Lincoln was extremely severe when he suspended habeas corpus, giving the federal government the right to arrest protesters with no charges whatsoever. We think of Lincoln as a hero, and I do, but we also have to remember that civil liberties are often suspended during wartime, and the Civil War was no exception, and here we see people being arrested on trumped-up charges, uh, protesters being demonized in the media, and generally uh, civil liberties are tramped upon during times of war. I don't know if you heard in the news yesterday, Ted Cruz recently announced that he would like to start registering Muslims, and that was his response to the attack in Brussels. So this war did divide the nation. The media attempted to downplay the division. The government tried to suppress the dissent. But the number of doves that's what people who opposed the war strongly called themselves. Doves are the international symbol for peace, believe that the United States should withdraw from the war. Yet there were still many in the federal government that considered themselves hawks, those who favored sending greater forces to Vietnam to ultimately win the war. As I said at the beginning, generally, in the beginning of the war, the majority of Americans supported the war considered the protesters disloyal. Yet tomorrow's lesson about 1968 changed all of that. Many considered the protesters disloyal. As the veteran pointed out, it is one thing to protest a war, it's another to support the enemy. Some people did get radical in that regard. In fact, there are some famous photographs of Jane Fonda, a celebrity of the time, who went to visit the North Vietnamese and had herself photographed with Vietnamese weapons and Vietnamese flags and soldiers. So protest is one thing, disloyalty, um, that's different. Now, Throughout the mid-1960s, President Johnson continued the slow escalation. And this was criticized by both hawks and doves. Doves for any escalation, hawks for a lack of significant escalation. The apparent stalemate in Vietnam, despite the mounting Vietnamese casualties, eventually led the Defense Secretary Robert McNamara to resign. The same exact thing happened in the Iraq War when Donald Rumsfeld, then Secretary of Defense, resigned due to a lack of clear success in the Iraq War. So again, there are many parallels and comparisons. Here's an example of a, a different type of protest poster from um, Americans who supported the war. So first off, the Tet Offensive. Every year throughout the course of the Vietnam War, at the end of January, the Vietnamese celebrated their new year. It was a custom for the North Vietnamese as well as the Viet Cong to cease hostilities during that time. Soldiers knew it was a safe time to go on furlough and visit their families. Bases would go to low alert and it was just generally understood this was an okay time to relax. And then in 1968, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese launched a coordinated strike on over 100 South Vietnamese towns. Uh, the cause of this, what you see on 1C, the cause was the crowd 
contained Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops and launched attacks on over 100 towns. The effect of this, the one E on your notes, was that General Westmoreland declared the attacks a military defeat. In fact, we had the situation under control in less than a month. Not bad for putting down an insurrection. Yet the political ramifications of this were paramount. Because the year of this attack was 1968. The United States sent troops to Vietnam in 1964. Four years of fighting, tens of thousands of American soldiers dead, and yet still the Viet Cong were capable of such a well-planned and coordinated strike. And South Vietnam erupted in chaos for over a month. In fact, I've got some real footage from the Tet Offensive to show you. And you see, Tet Offensive changed public opinion. Before Tet, most Americans considered themselves hawks, meaning they supported an expansion of the war. After Tet, most Americans considered themselves doves. It was a profound effect on public opinion. Because once again, four years into the war, throughout the entire war, the military was promising that we were winning this thing, and now the enemy would manage to pin us down for over a month. It caused complete chaos throughout the country of Vietnam. And the mainstream media began to openly criticize this war. Meanwhile, Johnson appointed a new Secretary of Defense, as I told you before. The previous one, Robert McNamara, resigned. And the new Secretary of Defense, Clark Clifford, studied the war and concluded that this was an unwinnable conflict. That without resorting to total war tactics and nuclear warheads, we could not end this war. Meanwhile, Johnson's popularity continued to drop. 60% of Americans disapproved of his handling of the war itself. Meanwhile, the presidential election of 1968, the famous one that this often gets compared to. Senator Eugene McCarthy ran for the Democratic nomination as a dove, meaning he promised that if elected, he would seek an immediate end to the war in Vietnam. Running against him was Senator Robert Kennedy, brother to former President John F. Kennedy decided to enter the race after Johnson's poor showing in New Hampshire, one of the first states to report in the primaries. Johnson, the incumbent president, received such a low level of support in New Hampshire that he decided to not seek a re-election. One of the only incumbent presidents to not seek re-election. In fact, he is the only one who did not seek re-election as a result of a poor showing in the primaries. In fact, m commonly they don't even have primaries for it when there's an incumbent president. There was no Democratic primary in 2012. There rarely is. Yet Johnson's popularity was so low the Democratic Party was pursuing other options. And it became clear that Johnson was not going to be chosen to run for re-election. Spring of this same year, Martin Luther King was assassinated by James Earl Ray in Memphis, Tennessee. As I've told you previously, there were riots in over a hundred American cities in response to his death. Robert Kennedy, the very man who spoke at Martin Luther King's funeral, who gave us that great speech titled The Mindless Menace of Violence in Society, a great statesman who worked for peace in Vietnam and peace at home was shot and killed by a Jordanian immigrant because of Kennedy's unwavering support of the state of Israel. 
These two deaths led to riots throughout American history, demonstrations on college campuses. And generally, the late 1960s were a very disruptive time in our country, both because of the unpopular war in Vietnam, coupled with the racial tensions and economic troubles in our country, and the changing culture, and many other things led to a great period of unrest. Now this summer we're going to get to see the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. Something that happens at the conclusion of every presidential primary where the delegates, representatives from each state of both parties will meet at separate conventions to determine who the next candidate for president is going to be. So it's an exciting event. It happens in June of every election year. Now, in 1968, the election was rather chaotic. Eugene McCarthy running Promising Peace versus Robert Kennedy, who was winning the election. And upon accepting the nomination for president, he was shot and killed. Well, that doesn't often happen. Teddy Roosevelt was shot during a campaign, but he didn't die. In fact, Robert Kennedy is, to my knowledge, the only candidate that was shot and killed during a primary race. Now, Eventually, Vice President Hubert Humphrey won the Democratic nomination for president versus Eugene McCarthy, the uh, further left, pro-peace, anti-war candidate. Now, what I'm about to show you are scenes from the riot at the 1968 Democratic Convention. I want you to listen to what people were chanting and watch how the police reacted as protesters tried to force their way into the convention. They felt the Democratic Party had been so corrupt throughout this campaign. And Hubert Humphrey did not represent their interest to the point that some Democrats became violent, showing up at the convention and attempting to force their way in to change the decision of the Democratic Party. Meanwhile, inside this convention, a bunch of freaked out delegates who were surrounded by the National Guard were attempting to debate what position they should take on the war. And eventually the outcome was that the delegates decided they were going to adopt an anti-war plank, meaning they eventually decided that the Democratic Party was going to represent the peace ticket on the 1968 election. So meanwhile, Richard Nixon was the candidate for president on the Republican side in 1968. He promised to restore law and order in the United States as well as end the war in Vietnam. He called it peace with honor, and we'll get to that tomorrow. Though it didn't work out that way, that's what he promised the American people. There was a third candidate running in the 1968 election. Maybe you remember George Wallace the famous governor who stood in front of the University of Alabama to bar black students from entering. So that wacko decided he was going to run for president. And then somebody shot him. And that ended his candidacy. So he didn't die, but he was generally hated by many as a sign of the racial tensions and bigotry that was so prevalent in southern states and in other parts of the country as well. Richard Nixon won the presidency and will continue his story at a later time. So yesterday we talked all about 1968. The tragic assassination of Dr. King, as well as Robert Kennedy, 
the tumultuous Democratic primary and national convention where riots took place outside of it. And now we have a new president, Richard Nixon. Like the previous presidents, the movement for peace was not going like the government had hoped. North Vietnam and the Viet Cong would not give up, ever. And they had demonstrated that through the millions of deaths. The National Security Advisor under Richard Nixon was Henry Kissinger. He worked on a new plan, one he hoped that would end our disastrous involvement in this prolonged conflict. The word quagmire was coined to describe an inescapable place. Now, Vietnamization was the plan that Henry Kissinger came up with. And it was that as U.S. troops would withdraw, the South Vietnamese military would take the burden of stopping the insurgency and defending South Vietnam from the Viet Cong. The idea was that the South Vietnamese military would become self-sufficient and sustainable, and that the United States military would prepare the South Vietnamese military to do this. Nixon called it peace with honor. The idea that we could end our involvement, yet maintain our dignity. That South Vietnam could remain independent of communist rule, yet the United States troops could go home. In fact, Nixon ordered an expansion of the war. Because in order to be able to leave Vietnam, we had to stop the supply line that was going to the insurgency. We had to break the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Well, the Ho Chi Minh Trail went through Laos and Cambodia, two, quote, neutral countries to the west of Vietnam. And so we started bombing these countries, which weren't actually neutral, and we conducted multiple raids revealing Viet Cong hideouts in these two countries. These raids were a military success. They accomplished their objectives. They broke the supply line. And they infiltrated these hideouts. Now, Richard Nixon once said that opposition to the war in Vietnam was the single greatest threat to our country. He said the division was corrosive to morale, to both our soldiers and then the home front. He believed that most Americans continued to support the war and continued to support Nixon's policies in Vietnam. He called them the silent majority. He believed that most people were moderate, most people were mainstream, and those supported the war. Like we studied yesterday, when the news broke that a U.S. platoon had massacred civilians in My Lai, a village containing over 100 men, women, and children, and they had all been brutally murdered by the U.S. military. The village had been set fire to and the women were raped before they were killed. Lieutenant William Kelly was convicted of war crimes and sent to prison. This matter was dealt with swiftly and harshly. Yet the political blowback to the My Lai massacre was perhaps the single greatest turning point politically in the Vietnam War. Coupled with the 1970 U.S. invasion of Cambodia to clear out enemy supply centers, these two events led to the single greatest student walkout in American history. One and a half million college students 
completely shut down 1,200 college campuses across the country. in protest of the Miley Massacre and the apparent expansion of the war six years after it was begun. For example, a lot of people believed that the ordering of soldiers to slaughter innocent people was inexcusable. And it brings up an interesting ethical debate. Yesterday you read a neat article about the details of the Miley Massacre and you reflected on it. And so now that you know more about this, what do you think? Is just doing my job, just following my orders, an excusable defense, or were these soldiers also guilty of murder, even though they were following orders? What do you think? I'll skip this for time's sake. All right, so the next story I have to share with you um, is crazy as well. At Kent State University in Ohio, peaceful protesters, students, demonstrated on the campus for three days straight. The president of the university called the mayor and um, requested that these students be removed from the commons area. The mayor called the National Guard. The National Guard was dispatched to Kent State University to remove these students from this university. Now these 18-year-old National Guardsmen were given deadly firearms. They had M16s loaded with hollow point rounds, deadly ammunition. I'm going to show you the video. So again, if a picture is not convincing of excessive force, here's the video of the event. Now what you'll also see in this video is a rather chaotic scene. In fact, when a hearing was conducted, and one was, these men had the right to testify and give their side of the story. The young men claimed that no one remembers who shot first. The officer claimed that he had not ordered his men to fire. Yet shots did occur, and four students were killed. Now, the same occurred on the campus of Mississippi State in Jackson. In response to this, hundreds of thousands of people began to rally in protest or support of the government. Now, when Nixon invaded Cambodia in 1970 and the American public reacted with fury, Congress repealed the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, revoked the President's right to wage war. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Pentagon Papers were published showing that the United States had plans to enter Vietnam even while Johnson was promising he would not send troops. Proof of our government lying to us. And if a bullet point is not sufficient evidence, it was a 5,000 page document showing irrefutable evidence that the Johnson administration was lying to us about entry to the Vietnam War. And it confirmed the belief of many that the government was not honest with us about its intentions. And so finally, America's longest war was coming to an end. 
In 1971, 60% of Americans believed we should withdraw from Vietnam by the end of the year. In the very next year, the North Vietnamese launched yet another attack of South Vietnam. The United States responded in a massive bombing campaign called In fact, the bombs dropped on North Vietnam during this bombing campaign were the equivalent of several different nuclear warheads. Meanwhile, our National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, finally agreed to a complete withdrawal of U.S. soldiers, claiming, quote, peace is at hand. The South Vietnamese rejected Henry Kissinger's plan of peace with honor. Peace talks broke down, and yet again we resumed bombing on a massive scale. Finally, Congress called for an end to the war, and peace was signed between the United States, the Viet Cong, and North Vietnam in January of 1973. The agreement reached there was that North Vietnam would leave South Vietnam alone. and that diplomacy would ensue. And this diplomacy eventually failed. The North invaded, and Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, fell to the North Vietnamese in 1975. And so what you're about to see here is the fall of Saigon. The legacy of the Vietnam War. You know, I get emotional when I go to the Vietnam War Memorial. And I walk down and I, I run my hand along the wall, thinking of the soldiers who died in this conflict. Some of them were folks that my dad knew well and that my uncle fought with. And though it was a generation before my time, I tried to, to make it feel real. I try to think of people that I'm close with and people that I've known to have to serve and to be called into war even though they didn't want to. And sometimes it's hard to make a story feel real and you have to use your imagination a bit. But I take comfort in the fact that it doesn't feel real and that yet we don't have to relate to something like this in the way that the people of the 1960s and 70s did. And I pray that nothing like this will ever happen again. But we have to understand it so that we can identify these things in the present day. You see, over 58,000 Americans lost their lives in this tragic conflict. Over two million North and South Vietnamese died in this war. And as veterans returned, they faced hostility, they faced indifference, and misunderstood. Many developed post-traumatic stress syndrome. And yet it was misunderstood in its time. No one understood what it means to be haunted by the things that you've seen and how that can lead to severe mental illness. And that's what the movie Rambo First Blood was based on. The later Rambo movies became gratuitous violence, but the first one was rather thought-provoking. It was about a young man returning from Vietnam, unable to adjust to civilian life. Meanwhile, the transition to communism in Southeast Asia. The communists put 400,000 South Vietnamese into labor camps. Over one and a half million fled, many to the United States. I went to school with a number of children who were uh, children of families who had fled Vietnam. 
Civil War broke out in Cambodia. Sadly, the domino theory proved true. The Khmer Rouge regime seized power. Under a dictator named Pol Pot, like Stalin hoped to establish a, quote, communist utopia, but in order to do so, he killed anyone who expressed discontent, anyone who spoke against his absolute authority, and he used children to do it. Pol Pot is our third largest mass murderer in history, the dictator of Cambodia. He would raise children into the army, brainwashing them and teaching them that the murder of people was okay as long as, he was, as they were following his orders. And a child has not yet learned to question authority. A child has not yet developed the critical thinking skills necessary to understand morality. They followed his orders without question. And his killing squads caused the murder of, some say, up to three million. But we don't know exactly. Thank you. Continuing the legacy of Vietnam, one positive was that the draft mm -hmm. has been abolished. That forced conscription has not been used ever since. And we, yet we cannot be assured that forced conscription will never be used again. Though the draft was extremely unpopular, we must be vigilant. We must be concerned and active citizens to make sure that we don't engage ourselves in pointless wars that will lead to the forced deployment of our friends and loved ones. In 1973, Congress passed the War Powers Act, limiting the power of the President to wage war. Within 48 hours of sending soldiers anywhere, the President must inform Congress and the American people. President Obama was following this when he killed bin Laden because SEAL Team 6 was in country less than 48 hours. It was able to be conducted in secret. The President still has the power to make swift action, but he has the obligation by federal law to inform Congress within the appropriate time. The President may maintain troops in a country under executive order for no more than 90 days. Again, giving the President the authority to act quickly in response to a crisis, but the accountability to the American people. The war has led to cynicism about the government. Because sadly, it has been proven time and again that our political leaders cannot be trusted. And yet again, necessitating the need for a clear understanding of how our country works and how it's worked in the past. I hope I've done, if nothing else, in this chapter to convince you of your need to understand our history and understand our present. because you will be taken advantage of if you're not.